gentlemen, the Joseph Slip Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin presents The Halls of Ivy. <laughs> curious. I tasted it. Now I know why Slits is the beer that made Milwaukee famous. If you like good beer, you'll find it pays to be curious and learn about Schlitz for yourself. Now, the Halls of Ivy. Welcome again to Ivy. Ivy College, that is, in the town of Ivy, USA. Music, as we all know, has always played a large part in college life, and most college presidents enjoy it in all its forms. From the students' whip and poof song through Beethoven's Ninth, right up to that most musical of all sounds, the rustle of a big fat endowment check. Dr. William Todd Hunter Hall, the president of Ivy, bows to no one when it comes to music appreciation. In fact, he's even an accomplished performer, something his wife, the former Victoria Cromwell of the English stage, never knew until this evening. At the moment, both are seated on the porch of their home, and Mrs. Hall says, That instrument is known as a what? It's known as a recorder. No, 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 the other name you said. Well, it's known as a recorder or fipple flute. Huh. Sorry, it sounds just as though you were saying fipple flute. I am saying fipple flute. Fipple flute. Why on earth is it called that? <laughs> Obviously because it happens to be a flute, equipped with a fiddle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what there is to laugh at. A fiddle is merely a plug or stopper in the upper end of it. It's a very ancient and honorable instrument, and possessed of a really lovely tone. Would you like to hear it? Very much. All right, here goes. Uh, you must remember I haven't played in years. Well, you know, darling, I... since birth, I have been accustomed only to the finest in fiddle flute playing. But uh, I shall lower my exacting standards for this occasion. Oh, good. It has a really lovely tone. Now, listen. I wasn't even sure I still had it, but, um, <laughs> but luckily I remembered that large trunk in the attic, and there it was, wrapped Toddy in a... proceed to fiddle. Well, <laughs> you, you, you see, if you don't think, it has a really lovely tone. Well, that must be Professor Quinn Cannon now. Well, don't go in. Penny will answer it. Did he say you'd be summoned by telephone? I don't remember. You know, when he told me I was being considered for membership in this club, I was really bowled over. Hmm. Oh, has it rung off? No, Penny's answered it. What's it all about, anyway? Well, it was quite unexpected. Quinn Cannon simply fell in with me as I was walking home the other evening and said he and a few other faculty members were starting this club. The Ivy Once a Week Chamber Music and Knockworth Society. <laughs> I, I gather we are to meet once a week, play chamber music, and eat Knockworth. Yes, the name is subtly suggestive of that. Yes, it is. Well, he said they wanted about a dozen good men. Uh, he and the other moving spirits would vote on them all, of course, and ask me if I played any musical instrument. I said yes, the fiddle flute. And he laughed and said he'd be seeing me. Uh, oh, Penny. Yes, sir? Uh, what did he say? Say, sir. Yes, the telephone, just now. Oh, he said, listen, baby, don't ask questions. Just come down here with bail money. Is that Quinn Cannon said that? No, Mum, it was the wrong number. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Penny. Quite all right, sir. Any time at all. I'm almost certain, he said, the first meeting would start precisely at eight. Well, of course, he may merely stroll over to fetch me, his house being right across the street. Mm, perhaps you misunderstood the date. It may not be tonight. Oh, well, perhaps it isn't. Why don't you play something? Go ahead, fiddle away. Very well. Here we go, then. It, it, it has a really lovely tone. Now, listen. But the meeting is tonight. Look over there. Professors Warren, Wilder, and Lazar, all carrying instruments. Now, you see, they're turning into quincannons. <laughs> Good. That means we'll have great fun. 
A very convivial fellow. <laughs> ah, and here comes Quinn Cannon to fetch me. Now, now, don't wait up, darling. I can't say when I'll be back. You never know how these things are going. It's not time for you to leave. Well, I mustn't keep Quinn Cannon waiting. He's gone back in the house. He just went into the yard to pick up his evening paper. Oh. It's not eight o'clock yet. Sit down. And while we're waiting, let me hear you play. It seems to me I've heard a rumor that the triple flute has a really lovely tone. Oh, yes, it has indeed. Now, you, you just listen. <laughs> I can't tell you, Victoria, how much I'm looking forward to this evening. <laughs> <laughs> if you're that crazy about not worth pay, or No, 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 it's not that. It's just that although I know I have the respect of the faculty, and I think they like me, I'm often afraid that because of my position here... Uh, there's inclined to be very little give and take on a human basis. But the mere fact that Quinn Cannon and the others may regard me warmly enough to invite me to join is something that makes me feel almost like, uh, well, like one of the boys. Mm. I, I, I'd begun to suspect I was... <laughs> I forget the Latin term, but it means a wet smack. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, Vicky, look. Uh, here come some other club members. The Shaw, Butler, Cassidy, and... and um, uh, Reuben. Oh, 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 look at that lovely case of beer they're carrying. Ah, this is going to be a rollicking evening. I know it. Why, those are the liveliest sparks on the campus. What the heck do we care? They're really enjoying themselves, aren't they? I wonder what the devil's delaying, Quinn Cannon. Are you positive he didn't telephone? Mm, quite positive. Don't fret, Toddy. Quinn Cannon's the host. He's probably too busy at the moment. Yes, that must be it, of course. You know, it takes only a moment to telephone. Well, they may fetch you by some sort of ceremony that has nothing to do with telephones. Or, if it has, the telephone may be out of order. Ours is always getting out of whack, you know. Well, not in the last four years. Oh, there you are, then. I, oh, is it as long ago as that? But at any rate, I'm sure there's a valid reason for the delay. Yes, the telephone could be out of order. It often happens. Yes, a short circuit, for example. Of course, or even just a bit of that rubber stuff coming off and exposing the wire. Look, 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 there, there, there go Weaver and Hudson. I didn't know Weaver played the tuba. <laughs> He's very clever. He must be to keep a tuba secret. <laughs> Ah, here comes Quinn Cannon now. I... No, no, he's only turned off the porch light. Hail, hail, the gangs are here. And gone in again. Well, I... I suppose he's not expecting anyone else. We doesn't mean that at all, Toddy. Professor Quinn Cannon is very economical, even frugal man. Well, you really think that's why he... It isn't eight o'clock yet either, is it? Nowhere near it. Two minutes off. Uh, you, you, you don't um, suppose I uh, I've been blackballed, do you? Oh, why on earth would you be? Well, they they might not think I measure up to chamber music and not worse. They, so here, here comes Grogan. Vicky, do you suppose that's how I am to be informed by the campus policeman? Maybe. Uh, Mr. Grogan. Oh, is that you on the porch, Dr. Hall? Yes. Uh, you don't by any chance bear a message from Professor Quinn Cannon, do you? I do indeed, sir. Well, now, now, don't wait up for me, Vicky, darling. Good evening, sir, and to you, ma'am. Good ma evening, Mr. Grogan. Well, it looks like a great evening shaping up across the way, yes, don't it? Yes, it really does. Mm -hmm. But no expenses spared, as the saying goes. You know what I've been doing the past hour? Delivering messages for Professor Quinn Cannon all over faculty roles. Special hand printed messages. Oh, I was wondering why he didn't telephone. No, oh, he's not a man to do things by half. It's a most special occasion, he says to me. It is, I says to him. It is, indeed, says he to me. Well, you came just in time. It's eight o'clock. It is, indeed. That clock on the chapel hasn't been a minute off in 31 years. Oh, I could tell you a story about that clock. In 1919. Um, I you said you were carrying messages for Professor Quincannon. I am, sir. He asked me especially not to forget to deliver to you. Mind you, don't forget, he says to me. It's most important. It is, says I to him. It is indeed, says well, he to I'm me. I'm sure we'd be very grateful if you'd tell us what it is. Uh, yes, ma'am. Could you spare some mustard for the knockwood? Uh, yes. <laughs> Certainly, I'm on my way over, and I... 
What was that? Uh, Professor Quincannon said he could use some mustard for the knockwurst if he had any to spare. The stores are all close to Zeta me. Are they, says I to him? Yes, they... sir. Is that the only message? Why, no, ma'am. No, it's not. I was asked for a loaf of bread, too. I uh, asked you that. I'm sure of bread, he says to me. Are you, says I? Well, I, if you just go to the side entrance, Mr. Groban, I'm sure Penny will oblige you. Oh, well, thank you, ma'am, and good evening. Good evening, sir. Hmm? Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Good evening. Well, I, uh... I suppose I won't be needing this anymore. What is it? It's a, a sour pickle. <laughs> I I thought it might add to the fun. <laughs> you know, if, if I suddenly began munching it in front of the brass section, uh, the mouths would have uh, puckered up, you see. <laughs> and uh, well, they'd have fluffed notes. And May I nice. tell you something, Toddy? Dear Toddy, I think you're well out of it. In the first place, Knockworth never did agree with you. Why, I was only going to pretend to eat some, just for the sake of form, you know. Friendship means a great deal to you, doesn't it? Yes, it does indeed, my darling. Our own little friendships may seem unimportant, but if everyone cultivates his own and seeks new ones, the spread of goodwill, like ripples on a pond, may extend beyond the limits of our vision and go far toward averting the dissolution of my world and yours in a blast of hate. Oh, I do agree with you, Toddy. Mm. Living as we are today in the shadow of a man-made cloud, shaped like a poisonous toadstool, it behooves us as individuals to see that friendship doesn't become the sole concern of, of wall motto publishers and sofa cushion embroiderers. And if I sound more like Gabriel with a trumpet than Bill Hall with a fiddle flute, I'm sorry. <laughs> I never did get a chance to hear it. What, the trumpet? Oh, the fiddle flute. Yes, of course I'll play something then. It, it has a re really lovely tone. Now, now just listen. Uh, what would you like to hear? <laughs> curious. I tasted it. Now I know why Schlitz is the beer that made Milwaukee famous. We'll return to the Halls of Ivy starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman in just a moment. But first, let's hear what happened at Shirley's house when a young suitor won her father's hand in friendship. The first time I called on Shirley, we were obliged to share the living room with her father. He was there when I arrived and there when I left. Permanent as a cornerstone, and almost as talkative. Cut off from the rest of the household by the evening paper, Shirley's father devoted himself to the news and um, to a bottle of Schlitz beer that stood on the table beside him. His approval of Schlitz seemed obvious. Never having tasted Schlitz myself, I was tempted to ask him if it lived up to its reputation. But, um, frankly, I didn't have the nerve, so I kept my curiosity to myself that first evening. But the next time I called, Shirley came to the rescue by offering me a bottle of Schlitz. And one taste, just one, was all it took to make me say, Brother, this is what I call beer. No sooner were the words spoken when down came Shirley's father's newspaper, and there we were, face to face. He fixed me with a sharp eye and said, Well, young man, I see you share my taste in beer. It seems we have something in common. Well, that broke the ice. Now, Shirley's father and I almost always spend part of my visits talking together over bottles of Schlitz. Shirley says she isn't quite sure she likes the new arrangement. I say, no wonder they call Schlitz the beer that made Milwaukee famous. <laughs> As we return to the halls of Ivy, we find a saddened Dr. Hall sitting on the front porch of their home with Mrs. Hall, listening to the faint sounds of festivity emanating from Professor Quincannon's house across the street. Mrs. Hall says, Let it out, Toddy. You've been sitting there stewing for ages. Let it out. Chew up the scenery. Ham it up. I was thinking about Quincannon. If next time we meet there should be any embarrassment, he might think it rather childish of me. 
On the other hand, if I lean over backwards to show I'm not offended, he, he's apt to think I'm I'm trying to cozy up to him in order to get into the club. Mm, poor Toddy. You're on the horns of a dilemma, aren't you? I am. <laughs> You'd think, wouldn't you, with all the great scientific advances of the last few centuries, someone would have developed a hornless dilemma by now. <laughs> If it were a harmless dilemma, I could make short shrift of it. <laughs> really? What is a short shrift? Uh, it's an old family recipe. <laughs> Grandma Hall's short shrift was famous for miles around. She was just about to make a fortune with it when suddenly the fashion changed. And everyone began to demand long shrift. <laughs> then, uh, uh, one day I... Uh, how much longer are they going to make that awful racket over there. Don't they realize it's time people were in bed? Well, it's only 9.30. Oh, well, some people might be going to bed. Anyway, it's unbecoming when supposedly mature men, responsible members of the faculty, behave like a lot of schoolboys. They've done nothing but make noise and, and, uh, and laugh all night. Something ought to be done about it. I agree. Something certainly ought. You could mind a phone Grogan. Tell him to go over there and break it up. I was thinking of another line of action. What? Phone the town police? No. I was thinking you ought to go over there, fiddle flute in hand, tell them it sounds as though they were having a grand time, and ask very honestly and directly if you might join them. Oh, my dear, I couldn't. I, I wouldn't. I haven't been elected. Don't you understand? They might not want me. But they would if they knew you wanted them. Oh. I don't want them. Sitting up all night playing interminable choruses of McNamara's band. Well, that's not my idea of a good time. I, I infinitely prefer a quiet walk or a good book. Toddy, you've attracted Professor Heathcliff's attention. Heathcliff? Well, don't tell me that blister is a member of Quinn Cannon's club. <laughs> He's coming up the walk. That you up there, Skipper? Oh, uh, yes. To my sorrow. And how are you tonight, fair lady? Quite well, thank you. It's a lovely night. If you were out enjoying it, please don't let us keep you. Oh, not at all, not at all. I was merely strolling past to see if Professor Quinn Cannon actually was indulging in an infantile exhibition as I'd heard that he intended. Had he asked you to join? No. I was eligible, of course. I played the glockenspiel, you know. Why, I didn't know. Oh, good heavens, yes, Skipper. I played the glockenspiel for 30 years. Uh, you must be tired by now. <laughs> I beg your pardon, fair lady. I said I've always admired the glockenspiel. Yes. As I say, I was eligible, but I let him know so definitely by my manner that I was not the sort to be interested in juvenile horseplay that he never even asked me. What a hideous sound they were making. Don't they realize it's time people were going to bed? It's only 9.30. Well, some people might be going to bed. I'm highly gratified to see you're not over there, Skipper. You're the same sort of person I am. Oh, I am? Am I? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, indeed. More the cerebral type. For us, the quiet walk, the good book, the solitary meditation. The star grape. You spoke, fair lady. I said, I think I'll trace along upstairs. It's getting a bit chilly. Oh, well, then I'll be moving along. Good night, fair lady. Good night, skipper. I hope you can sleep with all that fun. Uh, <coughs> that noise going on. Good night. Did I sound like that a few minutes ago? Uh, yes. Have you changed your mind about going over there? Well, I won't try to pretend I don't want to. I've always detested make-believe, haven't you? Oh, darling, you're asking someone who was once an actress. And you haven't always detested it. I can remember at least one instance when you enjoyed it immensely. At least you seem to. When was that? Mm, backstage one night in London, shortly after we met. Of course, I remember in your dressing room. Mm -hmm. I happened to mention that I'd never been behind the footlights. And you took me onto the stage. I stumbled over a prop on the way, I remember. It was a bench from the garden scene. Yes. Uh, and then then you turned on the moon. That was an inspiration. We even had music. There was a street musician playing somewhere outside. I can still remember the tune. It went like this. I 
forgotten we ever heard it that night in the theatre. It came through so faintly. Well, how do you like it from this side of the footlights? It's awfully big, isn't it? Listen to the echoes. Far more mysterious and romantic than from the audience side. Think of all the fun and the fine words, the music and the beauty that have been carried across those footlights, and the hard work and the heartache that doesn't get across. Full of ghosts. Listen to the echoes. Heavens, Vicky, what power, what opportunity is given to the people of the stage? Mm. You must have a touch of the actor in you. Oh, I have. In the privacy of my room, I've often played most of the roles created by Mr. Shakespeare. Hmm. If I say so myself, my Hamlet leaves nothing more to be done in that direction. <laughs> and my Romeo is good for a dozen curtain calls at every performance. <laughs> What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So Romeo would. Were he not Romeo called? Yes, Mr. Shakespeare didn't know his semantics. <laughs> Might have made a great difference to Juliet if his name were, say, Hezekiah. Romeo doth thy name. And for that name, which is no part of thee, take all myself. I take thee at thy word. Call me but love, and I'll be new baptized. Henceforth I never will be Romeo. I think he embraces Juliet then. Oh, no, no. She, she's up on the balcony. And he's in the orchard below. At least that's the way Shakespeare wrote it. Well, there's such a thing as taking stage directions too literally, don't you think? Such a love scene really calls for something better than bellowing at each other from a distance. Yes, I think you're right. Romeo should be up on the balcony by that time with one arm around her. Not both? Uh, no, he holds onto the railing with the other. <laughs> uh, something like this. Yes. It, it works out rather well, doesn't it? With love's light wings did I o'er perch these walls. For stony limits cannot hold love out, and what love can do, that dares love attempt. What love can do, that dares love attempt. Victoria. Yes. I, um, may I ask you something? Yes. Um, do you think Bacon really wrote Shakespeare's plays? Does that really concern you right now? <laughs> no. No, that, that, that was shyness speaking, not I. Victoria, I... Listen. Listen to the song that man in the street is playing. Oh, yes. It's the old, old apple song. Yes. Straight from the hedgerows in the heart of England. I once heard the words, but um, I've forgotten them. Oh, you remember. I'll give my love an apple without any core. I'll give her a house without any door. I'll give her a palace wherein she may be, and she may unlock it without any key. Yes. Yes, it comes back to me. Now, I remember the ending. My heart is the palace wherein she may be, and she may unlock it without any key. Well, I didn't know you could play. Well, what makes you think I'm playing? I'm quite sincere. Toddy, it's Professor Quintana. Well, it makes no difference. He has no right to impugn my motives. I've never philandered. It's and, Professor and Quintana, and what? Darling. Who? What? Who? Oh! oh. oh. Quintana. William, William, where have you been? Over to London, kissing a queen. Why, you could have knocked me down with a feather. I stepped out for a breather, heard music from over here, and... Why on earth didn't you tell me you could play a musical instrument when I asked you? I, I did tell you. I distinctly said I could play the fiddle flute. Yes, I heard you, but naturally I thought you were pulling my leg. I mean, after, well, after all, a fiddle flute. It's a very ancient and honorable instrument and possessed of a really lovely tone. Well, look here. Wouldn't you like to come over to my house, I mean? To your house? Yes, you remember. The Ivy Chamber Music and Knockworth Society. Oh, that. Is that tonight? 
<laughs> Mickey, still here? Yes, Don't I you did. remember my telling you? Well, I, I'd quite forgotten. Oh, come over now. We'd be delighted to have you join. Would you really? Oh, I don't know. I really hadn't thought about it, and it's rather late. I... Of course, Dr. Hall is more the cerebral type, Professor. You know, the quiet walk, the good book, the solitary meditation. Uh, Victoria, please, let me. I'll handle this. Uh, like Professor Heathcliff, the well-known glockenspiel enthusiast. Well, I'm sorry, Doctor. I just thought... No, 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 no. I accept your invitation gladly. Let's go. Good. Come on. Any knockwares left? Uh, Victoria, don't wait up for me, my dear, will you? Where's that pickle? Never mind, I have it. Will I need a hat? No, I guess it's just across the street. Come on, Quinn Cannon. Good night, darling. Good night. Have a lovely time. Good night, Mrs. Hall. Good night. Why on earth is it called a thistle flute? Because it's a crippled with a fit. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a flute with a quit of it. Well, you clarified the matter with an obscurity. What is a fipple? A small plug in the upper end. Oh. I thought perhaps Fipple was the name of its inventor. Uh, by an odd coincidence, his name was Fipple. Johann Sebastian Fipple. <laughs> Small man with two heads? Yes. Uh, uh, three heads. Oh. He built himself as the Fipple Trio. Available for parties, weddings, and fish fries. No boozer, no chaser, have own tuxedo, will travel. <laughs> One night stand? Only in the Arctic Circle. Six months engagement. <laughs> Evidently not afraid of uh, critical harpoons. Um, his skin was thick enough to withstand them. I suppose, like the saxophone, the uh, fiffle flute has been called an ill woodwind that nobody blows good. The fiffle flute is an intellectual instrument. It does not depend on sax appeal. <laughs> <laughs> For peace sake, how long can you keep this up? <laughs> Until the memory of man runneth not to the contrary and the Knockworth has departed. Ah, uh, good. I think we'll have a great evening. Yes. There we are. What the heck do we... Ready, Doctor? What Raise the curtain, we... Professor. Yes. And give me a chord in G. In we go. Here. What the heck do we care now? I was curious. I tasted it. Now I know why Schlitz is the beer that made Milwaukee famous. And here again are Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. William, you worry too much. Take things much too seriously. It's possible, Vicky. Quite possible. For example, now take this evening. All those faculty members are very fond of you. But how could they possibly know you weren't pulling their legs when you said you played a fiffle flute? Yes, there's that, of course. And I did have a wonderful time at Quinn Cannon's. Yes, maybe you're right. But I'm afraid I can't finish out my term as president of Ivy College, romping through the weeks with gay shrieks of carefree laughter and witticisms for one and all. It's a matter of record, I believe, that those college presidents who have been more stayed have. Have what? Stayed. <laughs> I see. Good night. Good night, everyone. Week at this time at the Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Cole. The other players were Gloria Gordon, Alan Reed, Zip Arquette, and Frank Martin. Tonight's script was written by Walter Brown Newman and Don Quinn. Our music was composed and conducted by Henry Russell. The Halls of Ivy was created by Don.